Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. All right, John, it's your turn. What did you select for us, John? I picked a story by Raymond Carver called The Father. It's a weird one. Yeah, it's very, 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 very short. Very short. And you're going to read a section from the middle. Yes, that's the plan. <laughs> the middle of the single page story. <laughs> that's right. Isn't he sweet, the mother said, so healthy, my little baby. And bending over, she kissed the baby on its forehead and touched the cover over its arm. We love him too. But who does he look like? Who does he look like? Alice cried. And they all moved up closer around the basket to see who the baby looked like. He has pretty eyes, Carol said. All babies have pretty eyes, Phyllis said. He has his grandfather's lips, the grandmother said. Look at those lips. I don't know, the mother said. I wouldn't say... The nose, the nose, Alice cried. What about his nose? The mother asked. It looks like somebody's nose, the girl answered. No, I don't know, the mother said. I don't think so. Those lips, the grandmother murmured. Those little fingers, she said, uncovering the baby's hand and spreading out its fingers. Who does the baby look like? He doesn't look like anybody, Phyllis said, and they moved even closer. I know, I know, Carol said. He looks like daddy. Then they looked closer at the baby. But who does daddy look like? Phyllis asked. Who does daddy look like? Alice repeated. And they all at once looked through to the kitchen where the father was sitting at the table with his back to them. Why, nobody, Phyllis said and began to cry a little. So you kind of told me about how you selected this story and it wasn't a super intentional thing. But had you read this before? No, I had not read it before. I was just poking around in stories and this one jumped out at me because it was short. It's by our buddy Raymond Carver, so it's not like it's short and crappy. It's got to be good. Yeah, that's what I figured too. Well, I mean, I I read it first before I was like, okay, we'll do this. (laughs) Well, this is one of those stories that I had to read the literary criticism on to see if I was anywhere in the right direction. No, you don't want to do that stuff. I know, I know, because I was, I was just like kind of at a loss here. What was interesting to me was that it, it like vaguely reminded me of the last story that you submitted, where oh, you yes. have this, you know, it's like about a the David parents, Foster Wallace one, yeah, yeah, the baby that's like burning in its diaper. But there seems to be like similar themes of like motherhood versus fatherhood in this traditional time period, whatever it is. It's like a vague time period. And like the father is just like not connected to this child, right? We're trying to figure out if they look like each other, but obviously the stretch is, are they related? (laughs) Is this the mailman's daughter? No, I think the father is supposed to be not his grandfather's child, not his own father's child. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I think his mother is uh, trying to hide the fact. All these little, her grandkids are stumbling upon the idea. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that makes sense too. It's just, I don't know how clear it is, you know? Yeah. I don't think it needs to be. Well, see, okay. So, okay. So you, so you think that the grandmother is like trying to tell the kids like, oh yeah, he looks like the grandpa. Like he's definitely like on our side of the family or whatever. Yeah. That's why he points out like he has his grandfather's lips. And then her daughter-in-law says, I don't know. I wouldn't say that. It's the same. Right. No, yeah, lips, definitely. Definitely right. just like uh, my faithful husband's lips. <laughs> and meanwhile, the, the father's sitting in the kitchen like, wait a minute. But you think that the grandmother was like unfaithful to the grandfather? That was the way I read it at first, yeah. But what's interesting there is that like, if he was unfaithful to the grandfather, it's a stretch to say that the, the child's related to the grandfather. The child's not related to the grandfather then. That's what she's trying to insist on it. She's trying to hide yeah. this idea. Yeah. But she's trying to skip a generation to do it. She's like, well, he doesn't look like like him but he looks like his father like he looks well, like she said that before everyone else pointed out that they look yeah. like daddy okay wow see yeah i i read it you know like i saw the grandfather bit and i was like this is a stretch but i didn't read it as like um the father and i'm being unrelated i kind of read it like this dad is like looking at this kid and like the kid's not mine but that's interesting yeah because why else would she bring that up whatever like whatever it is it's something about it did kind of remind me of that last story just because there's this like tension it, it was a weird like tension between the parents in the last story you know where like as this tragedy is unfolding like he's finding himself placing the blame on the wife yeah and here it's like one of these things where like we don't know what the father of this child the father is thinking in that kitchen and even when he turns he doesn't say anything but even when he turns and looks at them they just describe the face as white so you can like assign like kind of like any emotion you want but like if we're keeping with this idea that it's of this traditional time period you know where dad's taught you to be tough you know and they're kind of absent or whatever i don't know he's he, he could be thinking a million things but fathers in that time were just stoic and it's almost like the quiet 
quieter they were, the angrier they were. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, like, like I, I feel like almost like a, a father today in a story like this would not be silently sitting at the kitchen table. And this guy is just there and they're like tiptoeing and trying to make him feel whatever. But he's just like brewing in something. He's steaming over there. It's, it's weird. There's, there's a tension here, right? This is a very tense story. I mean, people start crying. Yeah. Well, the father just seemed like he's in the kitchen. I don't know, drinking his coffee, doing whatever. And then uh, the rest of the family were all cooing around the baby. But he's tuned into what's happening because he's like, what are they talking about? Yeah, he like hears them talk about himself. Daddy looks like nobody. <laughs> basically saying oh we're discovering in this moment that daddy's not actually part of the family like he thinks he is yeah so the last sentence though he sounds like a ghost because yeah, i this think he's all- shocked i think it, my my reading of that is he's just like shocked what what are you yeah. guys saying what is happening it says what did you do mom he had turned around in his chair well they're all staring at him he had turned around in his chair and his face was white and without expression which is like it's blanched right yeah yeah i mean that's like i I read it like ghost white, like shock, horror, whatever, yeah. or anger, or just, you know, the blood's rushed out, whatever it is. But like, yeah, white and without expression. When when you say that someone's without expression, like in a lot of ways, that is an expression, right? When you, you're yeah. like actively arranging your face into nothing. Anyway, I read that and I was like, oh my God, it reminded me of like the Pixar logo, the little lamp that like turns and it's just like light and you don't get to know like, I don't know, that's that's what it felt like. Felt like he was finally like turning his attention and you were like this is without expression anyway what i was gonna say is like in a short story group of amateurs i feel like this is the kind of line that we would read and be like well you didn't really tell us one way or the other we'd like to know more you know it's like raymond carver you're like well i guess he knows what he's doing so this is all we get well that's i think that's the strength that carver has set up what the father's reaction is through everything that happens before that i actually read that last line i was like do we even need that last line oh wow you know kind of like a hemingway thing where you just delete the last line so maybe it's not necessary for you it would have ended here but he has to look like somebody phyllis said wiping her eyes with one of the ribbons and all of them except the grandmother looked at the father sitting at the table something like that like i I think that would be sufficient i think that would still land in the same yeah that's interesting because it does also like kind of redirect the focus to what it is that you suspect is going on here which is that the grandmother can't even look at the sun yes why can't she look at him and then he look he looks to her i mean he looks to everybody but he he's trying to turn to her like you're obviously hiding something mom (laughs) what is it like i don't want to ask you so i'm going to hide my expression not in front of everybody i'm afraid (laughs) i think i mean if you want to do the literary critical thing and do interpretations it's the story is about identity yeah and the it's the father who's having the identity crisis because of the conversation it's like am i part of the family or not because daddy doesn't look like anybody it's like the kid's reaction yeah when I look at short stories like this, that they're so short, it's kind of like, did they dip out too early? You know, was this like a cop out? But I think, I don't know, it's kind of like the more we talk about it here, this does seem like a, a decent length just to like illuminate this idea that this dad is going to have a crisis. You know, we don't need to see this play out over the course of a novel. I don't really, it doesn't really matter whether he is the father or not, or whether he was adopted or whether he's the product of infidelity, whatever it is. It doesn't really matter because to your point, he's struggling right now with an identity crisis this is going to like affect him personally and probably his parenting in a lot of ways yeah it'd be interesting i mean the, this baby does apparently look like him so if he you know and he so he's created his own family there if he then learns that his what the person he thought of as his father was not really his father it might change the way that he acts as a father too yeah i mean you see like some men like you know who didn't have fathers maybe don't know how to act like one and other men become great fathers because they you know they're leaning in and like filling that that void that they had so this guy like you said is going through an identity crisis and i think it feels like a decent length story to just kind of say that like he's gonna go through an identity crisis there doesn't need to be a resolution there because i mean we're already doing the thing that like we don't like what readers do which is like projecting and wondering and like thinking how this might end up in the future because it's not on the page and it maybe doesn't matter to the story but it's a good example of the type of length of story where you're kind of just left with these possibilities and it makes you wonder those that's a that's the mark of a good story you know you don't want to like dip out before you've given a reader everything that's kind of cheap you know you don't want to like write a story about like a murder mystery and then never tell us that's not the kind of like wondering we want to do but this is like giving us a moment and we get to think to ourselves like this could go a million different ways and it really matters less which way it goes than the fact that he's at a crossroads right now and that this is like the moment where it kind of like happens to him 
Yeah, I was trying to remember. So the, the named characters here are the Phyllis, Carol, and Alice, or all the sisters of this new baby, right? Yeah. And then the other people are referred to as the father, the mother, and yeah. the grandmother. And I don't think they get names. Yeah. Because it's interesting to see who says the things, you know? Yeah. You know, because the kids are just like excited. It's a baby. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Love baby, Phyllis said. He loves us all, Phyllis said. Phyllis is really into this baby. <laughs> he has pretty eyes, Carol said. All babies have pretty eyes, Phyllis said. But the grandmother and the mother don't say a lot. Right. And then she said she's the one who uh, contradicted the grandmother and who she said he has his grandfather's lips. The grandmother said, look at those lips. I don't know. The mother said, I wouldn't say the nose, the nose. Alice cried. Now it's a sister. And then the mother's like, what about his nose? She's like, no, I don't think so. And she's like, it looks like somebody's nose. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> wow, the mother's so maybe you're right that like it's just the grandmother that's been grandma's unfaithful. trying to insist on this yeah because yeah, because the mom's kind of like open to interpretation she's like no i don't think it does really look but she's not worried about it because she she knows who she had sex with <laughs> but who starts i think it's the mother who starts no it's um phyllis who starts one of the sisters who starts crying a little at first in my memory of the story i thought the mother had started crying why does phyllis start crying because phyllis is a little wimp Because daddy doesn't look like anybody. Yeah, chill, Phyllis. Your dad is the Pixar lamp. Although cry doesn't necessarily mean weep. It could just mean like she's making noises. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But then she starts wiping her eyes. Oh, that's right. But I don't know. The reason I was kind of going through all that was I was thinking about this story in terms of there are six characters. And yeah. how long is this story? Like 500 words? It's really uh, short. Yeah. All dialogue. It's all dialogue. A little bit of character action here and there. Action beats. But what's it's six people. So like the story happens between the people. Like you, you're paying attention to who is saying what to whom. And it's usually just they're saying it to the crowd. You know, like everyone's speaking at the same time in a kind of a general conversation. Right. How people are, are interpreting what's being said. How they're hearing it. How they're reacting to it. Yeah. Yeah. The mother seems to get increasingly contemplative. Like she's like, oh, no. oh yeah. wait a minute. And she, so she's thinking things through. And that's why that last line about the father turning around in his chair uh-huh. is there because, you know, that's his reaction. Yeah. He, finally- he gets a reaction of turning around and yeah. being blanched or, or what I take to be blanched. And the grandmother not looking at him is really important too. Everyone's looking at him except the grandmother's not looking at him. Right. You know, it's like those little, the, the drama of the story takes place in the way that in which the characters how they're what they're saying and how they're reacting to what's being said right that's where everything lives in this little piece right we don't need anything else which is kind of remarkable as an accomplishment you know it's like that's what you want all of your dialogue scenes to be in a larger story and he's done it in like this really distilled fashion for this tiny story yes because a lot of times we talk about like realistic dialogue being the kind of dialogue where people like misunderstand each other or like interrupt each other talk over each other because that's just like an authentic way that people talk and it's most Mm -hmm. obvious when you read stories where dialogue is used as like actually communicating information it becomes like very boring you know where it's like I went to the store today. I bought bananas. It's like, no one cares. But what's interesting here is that it's not just like authentic dialogue because it, it it sounds like a real conversation, you know, where everyone's chiming in. What about this? What about this? What about this? But like you said, the power in it is how people are reacting to each other. Because I think a lot of times we talk about authentic dialogue being like, because you've misinterpreted or misunderstood, like it's not the correct reaction. And here it's like, they're like collectively reaching a conclusion together. So it is like the correct reaction. They're all Kind of, it's like building to something yeah and not all dialogue is supposed to do that or or can do it or whatever you know a lot of times it's like you know people arguing or that's kind of what my takeaway was going to be based on was because what every line like lands differently for each character yeah right so you have to think about what does the grandmother know that she's trying to hide right what does the mother not know but kind of wants to find out not knowing that she wants to find out and so whenever somebody says something they're taking that in in a different way right and then they're reacting and based on that they're reacting in different ways right right so being able to depict this really 
complicated conversation with all these different speakers and how each one's motivations and like internal beliefs and knowledge and like developing understanding of, of what's happening are changing all through the conversation and depicting just those moments when it's where things are coming into focus. Right. That's like a lot of the skill. That's a lot of what is driving the conversation forward as far as a, uh, a fictional object. You could see like this actual the conversation playing out in a much like more capacious way. Like, yeah, there's like always going to be more stuff going on. But when you write it down, you want you focus in on just those key moments. Yeah, that makes sense. And the key moments are the characters, their what they know, and the way in which they're hearing things that affects what they know. Yeah. Or what they're coming to learn. It's almost like you probably see this kind of dialogue more often with like like a murder mystery, you know? It's like Nancy Drew or Scooby Doo, where the characters all start Oh, what, and what if this happened? Yeah, the innkeeper. It's yeah. always the fucking innkeeper. Oh, oh. And like they're, they're building toward a conclusion that like they all want to reach. And what's interesting here is that like there's some people that are trying to keep things hidden, but like it's mounting evidence, you know? That's like yeah. where the tension comes from. But those are always fun conversations and those are always fun scenes when it's like people are figuring it out by talking to each other. Yeah, I mean, you can you can do that kind of thing in almost any situation. You can imagine yeah. like a couple that's at dinner and uh, somebody says something that the other one takes wait a minute what do you mean by that and you know yeah. they can just like build off of that and they don't have to necessarily even ask what do you mean by that but they're the way in which their follow-up is kind of leads the conversation right they dig deeper into the idea in a natural way because they might not be fully conscious that they're reacting that way right but that's what their their kind of like story motivation is yeah it all sounds so obvious to like talk about the types of conversations we all have in real life, but I guess it's not obvious because when we end up sitting down and writing stories, we don't take into account that this is how conversations actually happen, you know? Yeah. There's like advice that's always given about every scene you enter into, you want to know what your character's motivation is for the scene. Like okay. there's an overarching story motivation for like a character in a novel. Let's say it's like a quest story. They want to get something. So the yeah. entire novel is about them trying to get that thing. But, but every time they enter into a scene, there's yeah. a reason that they're in that scene. And you that as a writer sense. should like know that because that motivation is driving the drama of the scene and it's driving the interest of the scene and like why we're bothering to read it. Right. Right. On a page to page basis, as opposed to a, like an overarching basis. Yeah, where there's a, there's all sections that you're bored by. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you don't know who, why, like why why are they? What is this happening? Why are they doing this? I don't know. Then you're bored by it. But I think like in a dialogue like this, if you think about every character who's participating in the dialogue is having one of those motivations, those right. cross currents, those cross motivations are going to impact the development of the dialogue and the drama of the dialogue. Okay, so now I got to come up with a takeaway. Oh, yeah, I guess so. My takeaway is just <laughs> do that. <laughs> I didn't really have one going into this, but I think the only revelation I've had during this conversation, aside from the dialogue bit, is that you talked about how he's having like this identity crisis moment. And I don't think that like my takeaway is to write short stories or anything like that, to write stories that are under 500 words like this. You know, I'm not like saying that you should try flash fiction and like dip out before you like develop it. But, <laughs> but I like that you can distill this story down to that moment of an identity crisis versus like they're trying to figure out who the baby you know i like it summarized that way because then you can kind of think to yourself like if i had to distill my novel down into something what would i describe it as would i describe it as like an issue of paternity or an issue of identity you know like struggling with an identity crisis and i've done this before like given it as like a prompt where you've written a longer short story that you like but maybe it's not working or something and i've done it with my own work where I try to like take a 6,000 word story and make it a 500 word story or a 1,000 word story and it's really interesting what you end up not needing because to your point maybe there's scenes and you don't know why you've inserted them or you don't know why the character's there they seem kind of boring or they're not really part of the overall thing but I like that this is just like this brief conversation and then we get to leave knowing that this dad is currently going through an identity crisis he's gonna have to figure it out I don't know I guess my takeaway is like that if you can't summarize your story in that amount of words you know if you don't know what that core theme is one way to get to it 
it is to imagine how short your story could be to to achieve like the same like emotional takeaway and then That's otherwise kind of, yeah. yeah otherwise if you're not going to like actually do that work and like edit your story down just like try to think to yourself like is it a story about paternity is it a story about the grandma is it a story about this or is it a story you know at its identity crisis i asked a writer this recently and they had trouble doing more than a few sentences and yeah how can you like describe it in book jacket format where it's like concise and to the point and it sounds powerful and then you can really decide like do i need this next scene does it belong here is it boring i think one one interesting aspect of that is for this story if i describe it as this is a story of a man having an identity crisis that kind of assumes that he's the center of the story sure, yeah and, you know he is to a certain respect but you could also look at this as a grandmother being the center of the story like maybe it's her story yeah yeah, for and sure. Like, him turning around in the chair is him trying to confront her, but she's not looking at him. Like, and so that's the the pivotal moment. Yeah. And so what is that story for her? Right. Or right. you can imagine all kinds of different focuses for how you summarize what happened here, depending on which character's point of view you take. And I think that might be a good way to think about kind of multi-character scenes and multi-character stories is every character is coming at this from somewhere else. It's like my function in this story is not to allow the this other character to have an identity crisis. My function in the story is for my story, right? When you're contemplating a scene with many characters, figure out what is the most interesting way for each character to enter into the scene for, yeah. on their own basis. Right. And then if the scene really is about so-and-so having an identity crisis, you can start layering those things together. And that's how you build more complicated narratives that, that are longer than 500 words, right? Right. How many of those you want to include? Yeah. So he has an identity crisis and he but that morphs into the grandmother's having the crisis of her past catching up with her, you know, which morphs into the the mother having some other thing coming up if you were to develop it further and further. So what you said about having that nugget, being able to summarize is it's good for the whole story, for a whole book, for a whole short story, but it's also good for all the pieces of a story, like being able to identify what is this piece about? What is this piece about? What is this piece about? Right. And even within one scene, it's like, what is this? character about and what is this yeah. character about so then you know the two characters and then you can better portray them how they come together yeah that's a good way to think of like how you can spin out the full book and then like i guess like my takeaway would be something that only raymond carver could answer because <laughs> you said the story could also be about the grandmother you know hiding a secret but like he would have to answer that i think it's like, all in here like it yeah. just depends on how you want to but i mean like he, could, he would be the one that said like no this is a story about the father it's called the father or this yeah, is a story about the grandmother it's called you know it's actually a story about the grandmother this is what i intended you know whatever his intent yeah. was that's how he can kind of like decide how he's going to summarize it how he's going to like choose what comes next so yes. yeah, w- yeah we could give lots of examples but like you have to decide for your own story you don't want to like present a story to a group and they're like it's actually a story about this and if you feel yourself saying like no you read it wrong then it's your job to fix the interpretation mm-hmm. you know what i mean maybe you wrote it wrong <laughs> yeah maybe you wrote it wrong <laughs> so yeah All right. Well, thanks, guys. If you enjoyed this episode, consider joining our Patreon. Your support helps us keep the show running. Find out more at patreon.com slash why is this good podcast. And for industry news, writing tips, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Naples Writers Workshop. You can also subscribe to our monthly newsletter at napleswritersworkshop.com.